last speaker of our workshop. He is an associate professor at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the MIT in Boston. And in his research, he, he focuses, he investigates questions in applied and applied and theoretical questions in processing, the processing and acquisition of natural languages. But um, as his CV reveals, these are not his only interests. He holds a bachelor in mathematics, a master in anthropological sciences, and a PhD in linguistics. So I'm very curious to hear your talk, and um, please give them a warm welcome. All right, thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate uh, you sticking around until the very end of what has been a very interesting and exciting and very uh, inspiring and, and uh, discussion building workshop. So thank you for having me here and thank you for being here at the very end. Uh, I will try to do justice to your enthusiasm and endurance. Um, so this is work that, um, it's joint work um, and uh, the, this is a collaborative field. So this is sort of a reasonable first approximation of my uh, lab members uh, together with some select collaborators who are involved in this uh, set of projects that I'm going to describe. The people who are involved in these projects that I'm going to talk about are uh, shaded and uh, have some background shading. Um, once again, uh, you know, that does, all the mistakes you can attribute to me and all the good things you can attribute to them. Um, so broadly speaking, this is a talk um, that covers both, uh, I was very excited about the topic of this workshop because uh, I'm enthusiastic about bringing together the questions in uh, language understanding that span between um, the sciences and engineering, between uh, cognitive science and artificial intelligence. Uh, and what are these challenges of language understanding? So let me start, there are many challenges about language, but let me start with one, which is one of the biggest. How do humans communicate so well with language? Um, if you think about the fact that every day we hear hundreds or thousands of sentences that we've never heard before, the first approximation every sentence that you'll hear in your daily life is novel, and you produce hundreds more that you've also never heard before, or you've never said before, and you're somehow able to take meanings that maybe you never tried to mean before, and by and large, you're able to put those meanings in other people's heads, and this is amazing. How are we able to do this? Um, and this is maybe an even more mysterious question when you consider all the ways that it could go wrong. So what are some of the ways that it could go wrong? Um, for example, uh, language is ambiguous. So here's a very simple example sentence, and the women that discuss the dogs on the beach. This is going to be a participatory talk, so I will ask you a lot of questions. Please respond. The women discuss the dogs on the beach. You probably recognize that this is ambiguous. It's probably ambiguous in many ways, but one particular ambiguity is who's on the beach, right? So raise your hand if you, what came to your mind is that the women were discussing dogs that were on the beach. The dogs are on the beach. And raise your hand if you were thinking it was the women who were on the beach, but not necessarily dogs. Great. Okay, terrific. So we have mathematical tools that allow us to describe those differences in terms of tree structures. So discrete mathematics actually comes to our aid. Um, but actually, this is only the tip of the iceberg. I chose this sentence to bring out the ambiguity that is going to be readily apparent, but most sentences are ambiguous in ways that you don't even notice in daily life. Words have multiple meanings. Words can interact with each other and depend on each other in different ways. And all of this is resolved extraordinarily quickly in the same way that Getting a robot to walk on two legs is actually a very hard feat of engineering. We do it every day without even thinking about it, just as with language. We get zero in on what the person we're listening to or reading about reading from needs mostly intends to say. We're very good at that. Um, another difficulty is environmental noise. This is a very relatively low noise, clean environment where there's not a lot of competing sources of acoustic input uh, above and beyond my speech. Nevertheless, it's not a perfectly, uh, perfectly clean environment. And actually, you're able to understand language even in cocktail parties and so forth. Um, this is another challenge. Memory limitations. Language taxes your memory. I'm sure you all have difficulty, you all have experiences having a hard time keeping track of what, say, William Faulkner has read or has written. Um, and uh, nevertheless, we're able to address these memory limitations. <coughs> Finally, incomplete long knowledge of your interlocutors. Um, I don't know everything about you, and you don't know everything about me. In fact, this is the only thing that makes communication useful. Because if you knew everything about me and I knew everything about you, then we could predict each other. I could, if you could predict what I'd say, I wouldn't need to say it. I could go home and we'd all have lots more time. But um, in fact, actually, we don't know everything about each other. Of course, we don't know nothing about each other. If we knew nothing about each other, we would not have conventions that we share by which to transmit information usefully. 
So this partial knowledge state about each other is actually a necessary constitutive feature of communication, but it also poses a challenge. So these are the scientific questions around this talk. How do humans communicate so well with language? And likewise, how can we even get machines to do the same? And so today, um, I'm gonna talk, I have a two-part talk. The first part is gonna be addressing our, it's just gonna be a whirlwind tour of what I think of as like a first cut theory and uh, with some worked examples of how real-time language understanding unfolds with respect to the structure of language. Um, and this is going to highlight a couple of major features that I think are broad and important throughout all areas of cognition. Um, the notion of structure, the notion of probability and inference under uncertainty, notions of incrementality, that not, not all computation happens at once, and computation also has to happen as input occurs. Um, and then part two is gonna be evaluate, use it, it's gonna be sort of connecting um, the kinds of uh, empirical tools that we use to study um, humans actually to study machines. And we're going to take a whirlwind tour of some major features of uh, highlights of uh, the strengths and weaknesses of um, contemporary artificial intelligence models of language. So start with part one. I'm going to give you a general picture that I, I hope you take away if only a few things. This is sort of the general sort of bird's eye view picture of how the like human language understanding unfolds. And it's almost trivial in terms of uh, it almost must be the case. So in general, at any particular moment when you're listening or reading, you are within a sentence. Most of the time you're not at the beginning of the sentence, most of the time you're not at the end of the sentence, you're in mid-sentence. So, in, in, in <laughs> and so you're within some local context, say that's the context of a sentence, and there's some recent previous input. And furthermore, there's some broader context. We'll call that information outside the sentence, like earlier language that you've heard in the last few minutes or hours, non-linguistic information like visual to visual environment, your memory, things you know about each other, things you know about the situation. And um, from that extra extra sentential in information and context and previous input, you're able to make predictions, and in fact you are ubiquitously making predictions, as Carl at the beginning of yesterday talked about, you're ubiquitously making predictions without even thinking about it, about what upcoming input would be. Those predictions modulate how you treat that current input, you then of course, time goes on, and so current input becomes past input, and you update your context representation, and that uh, continues recursively as input continues to occur. And um, these predictions derived from that process of integrating uh, current, now previous input into context, are um, they're understandable and analyzable on many levels. There are many features of them. I'm just going to I'm just going to exemplify them briefly with a few cases. Um, every, in every case, I'll uh, give you the beginning of a sentence, and you will find that some kind of continuation comes to mind, and let's meditate on that a little bit. I'll try to do some predictions as well about what it was. So for example, um, Jamie was clearly intimidated. How do you think that the sentence continues? Why was he by. By. by, but not just the word by, but by actually introducing the source of intimidation, right? And this actually, it, there's a lot of semantics that involved here, but there's also syntax that normally the verb intimidate, the thing that follows the verb intimidate is the thing that gets intimidated. But in this kind of syntactic construction, the roles are turned around in linear order and now the intimidated uh, is first and the intimidator is later and it has to be introduced by this word bot. All of those things are on display in how your incremental inferences catch up. How about this? Terry Aiden, raise your hand if it's one of these. <laughs> Versus Terry Aiden, Raise your hand if it's one of these. Great, yeah. So, and you can see that probably those differences in your your subjective experience, once again, occur naturally, not with conscious reflection or any kind of serious effort. How about this? Semantic and situational knowledge. The children went outside to, raise your hand if it was play. And the squirrel stored some nuts in the, raise your hand if it was statue. No, raise your hand if it was tree. Now, here's a question. Where do squirrels store their nuts, really? They store their nuts in the ground, probably. <laughs> Raise your hand if you thought of ground. Few people. Actually, more people typically think of tree than ground, so this is actually not just about what's real-world plausible knowledge. There's some kind of series of formulation that's also involved. Further, statues, if trees are reasonable places to put nuts, statues are also good places to put nuts, because the reason you would sometimes squirrels will put trees and nuts in trees because they're sort of crevices, but they're also crevices in statues. So the difference in trees and statues is actually not a plausibility difference. It's actually something more than that. So it's not just about what's plausible, what's a likely thing. It's actually something beyond. It's about some kind of sort of, and it's shared. You all knew that you thought of the word play. You all knew that you thought of the word ground or tree. 
Um, so these are manifestations of some very uh, general points about the way that real-time language understanding works. Um, humans, when we understand language, we are incrementally, that is moment by moment, deploying rich, structured, grammatical, world, and contextual knowledge to interpret linguistic input. One of the best demonstrations in the field of psycholinguistics of this is a classic paper um, using what the well-known visual world paradigm, some of you have probably used the visual world paradigm, where a scene, either a physical or a virtual scene, these were physical scenes, is presented to somebody, and then somebody will, the, the, a participant will listen to a sentence, and their eye movements will be tracked as they're listening, and what the time course of what they're looking at when will reveal how incremental language understanding happens. So here's a case, this is a little simple display, forget the little arrows, just there's a pencil down here, uh, an empty towel, a, a towel that has an apple on top of it, and an empty box. And uh, participants listen to put the apple on the towel of the box. So notice that this is interesting because in the box, actually, in the same way that the dogs on the beach could have been about the women or about the dogs, in the box could be about towel or about apple. And actually, if you look at the eye movements, and they're pretty tightly time-locked to the unfolding of the sentence, when people hear on the towel, they're looking here, and the first thing they do will typically be to look at this empty towel. But then actually, when they hear in the box, they immediately realize, once again, this is not like a conscious introspective judgment, this just automatically happens, you realize that, oh, actually, you couldn't, in the towel couldn't have been describing where the, where the apple should go, because in the box is describing that. And so they look back to the apple and then to the box. But here, let me actually change part of the scene that actually doesn't even have anything to do with where the eyes tend to go. Okay, so now all I've done is substituted for this um, for this pencil. I've taken, I put in another apple that has done, is on an app. Now, if I give people the same sentence, put the apple on the top of the box. Now they don't really look to the top of so much, the empty towel so much. Instead, they look between apples and go. So why would this change make the response to on the towel different? All I did was substituted. Pen with instead of a pen or a pencil, an apple on an apple. What's the reason for that? Yeah. Uh, you said the first one, it sounded to me like I'm supposed to put the towel in the box and then put the apple on the towel. And then the second is, it, yeah. it sounds like you're, it's, it's ambiguous if you don't specify that the apple's on the towel. Well, so subjective experiences like you're describing, like maybe there was, I should have interpreted it as if there were different words, there are certainly things that people experience. Uh, I want to bracket those because they're out of scope of the present talk, but ask me later about it. Um, but there is actually a reason why you have this difference of pattern. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the same one as ambiguous, which apple you mean. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, so on the towel, where on the towel is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a true thing to say of this apple in both scenes, but it's a useful thing to say only in this scene. There's a reason why you would use on the towel in a way that modifies apple. And just think, so that difference, think about the sophistication of inferences that have to be involved in order to get that result. You have to know about the syntactic detection probabilities of words like in and on. You have to know about what a cooperative instruction giver would and wouldn't say about an utterance. You have to reconcile that with the visual scene, and that all has to happen very rapidly. So it's definitely outside the scope of contempt of state-of-the-art AI models of visual language, for example, and I think it's very useful to think about. Um, and we have, once again, we have structural descriptions for these differences. They, they, they involve the differences in this position. Um, so, from this, I actually want to say, from these kinds of examples, my goal is to build a, a satisfactory theory of language comprehension. And here are some of the major features that we're looking for. For example, that, um, that humans are very robust in language understanding. If there's ill-formed input, of course, I'm disappointed in almost every sentence I'm saying right now. Most of the time, you don't even notice. You're able to correct errors and imperfections in the input that accrues, and get to what, once again, is the intended meaning. You disambiguate well, we talked about that, we talked about incrementality, and, um, and furthermore, uh, and I want to illustrate this now in a moment, processing difficulty is differential and localized. And what I mean by that is that not every sentence is equally difficult to understand, and within a given sentence, not every part of the sentence is equally difficult to understand. And so, what's the relationship between these things? And um, I want to talk about this in the context of what I think is a major feature, a sort of major feature of the architecture of language understanding, is structure and the surprise that structure can induce in a very context-sensitive, context-contingent way. And so I'm going to do this by giving you forced incrementality in language comprehension. I'm going to present word by word a sentence at a relatively painfully slow rate. And just see what your experience is with it. Confused and a little surprised. <laughs> when, where? Where in the sentence? The last word. Anybody before the last word? No. Okay. 
So processing difficulty is localized, and it's different when not all the words are equally easy to understand. Who feels like they don't understand what the sentence means? Who feels like they understand what the sentence means? Let's see, you know, somebody hasn't talked yet. What, what, how would you paraphrase this sentence? There's a woman who tripped while bringing a sandwich home. Great. Wave your hand if you agree with that paraphrase. I will show you that paraphrase is actually, uh, that's actually an impossible paraphrase in terms of the grammar of the language. However, I do have theories of why you get that paraphrase. That goes out of scope. Ask me about it later on. Um, but uh, I want to now, what I want to focus on is why actually um, uh, those of you who, uh, who, um, may, who may have understood the sentence, um, why that sentence is legitimate, because some people may be feeling this is not even English. Um, so let me start by actually giving you the sentence. The woman who was given the sandwich from the station tripped, perfectly mine for everybody. And notice that it's not a paraphrase, that you, it's not equivalent to the paraphrase you gave, right? Because in this case, the woman is, uh, is not bringing the sandwich, the woman is getting the sandwich, right? Okay, so there's a rule in English that allows you, oh, so let me actually mention one other thing. So in these cases, brought and given are basically synonyms, um, except the modulo, the travel, Part. So the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen trip, is it okay? Does everybody agree with that too? Great. Okay, now there's a rule in English that allows you, uh, in these cases where you're using the passive voice in what's called a relative clause introduced by who, you can drop the words who was or who is. So I can take the word woman who was given, the bottom one, the woman who was given the sandwich from the kitchen trip, and I can just drop who was, and I get a perfectly good sentence, the woman given the sandwich from the kitchen trip. Everybody agree that that's fine? Now once again, let me just do analogical reasoning. I'll let, by analogy, if I can substitute given for brought in this case, brought, once again, notice it's in the passive, it's being used in the passive form, the woman who was brought. And I can also drop who was in this case, then likewise, once again, I can do the same thing. Okay. Now, if you're still feeling like that's troublesome, the reason is, the reason that it's not, that, that fourth, that, that top example is so much harder than the rest is because brought, unlike, sorry about this, brought, unlike the rest of them, has this special property that brought in, uh, unlike given, brought can be either as a form, as a, it can be a main verb, a simple like I brought the sandwich, or it can be a passive participle, I was brought the sandwich. The verb give is different in form in those two cases, I gave versus I was given. And that difference in the parts of speech that are available to the word interact with the broader context to make available an interpretation where, where, whereas the, in, the correct interpretation would be the entire phrase the woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen. That would be the subject, and then tripped is the verb. So it's the, it should be equivalent to the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. There's a sort of phantom other interpretation that's hanging around and is not even, descent, not even removed until, there's no evidence against it until the very end of the sentence, where the woman is the subject and brought the sandwich from the kitchen, is the, is the whole uh, is the whole reference. Now, the good news, we actually have very nice models of this kind of phenomenon. This is called a garden cutting phenomenon, and we actually understand it quite well. Um, and uh, the sort of a simple first approximation is that our knowledge of language includes structured tree type representations that re reflect the relationship, the structural relationship between words, and, um, and uh, the, um, the structural relationships between words and their um, the likelihoods of these relationships is the generative probabilistic models. So I can take a sentence like a man arrived yesterday and I can identify what the possible tree descriptions of it are. Some of those tree structure fragments will be more likely given the context than others. Okay, so I can decompose the probability of a full complex tree type object into the product of the probabilities that are required to put it together. And then I can do things like score it and I can do things like disambiguate between how likely is it for you to think that the women are on the beach versus the dogs are on the beach, in that earlier example. And I can apply this, I can actually create left-to-right algorithms that are pretty well understood in computational linguistics, they've been around for a while. And I can run them left-to-right and do something like um, ask at any certain point, what's the relative preference for the interpretation where the woman's doing the bringing versus the woman's getting brought. And as you go through the sentence, so the size of the trees is like an index of the relative appeal of the two interpretations. And what happens is, until immediately before this word kitchen, you're, it's very, very appealing to, um, it's very, very appealing to take it as, uh, to take um, the analysis where the woman's doing the bringing, and now we can invoke questions of algorithmic nature that maybe you're not always keeping all the interpretations on because of memory limitations. 
And so a really low probability interpretation might be something you discard altogether. And so when you get the disambiguating information, if you only kept this interpretation around, you would completely fail. If you happen to still keep this interpretation around and used it the right way, you might succeed. But that might be very unlikely. And that's a very simple, sort of fairly well understood account of this kind of incremental ambiguity resolution. Um, I'm going to skip over the next little thing about grammar and linguistic expectations. Um, I don't think we're going to have time just yet to talk about it, to talk about it here. But um, I want to talk about one more thing and give a language processing report going on and giving full um, time, enough time to looking at AI models. Um, so this is a specific case. This turns out that these examples, like the nuts in the tree and so forth, and the, the, su the surprise that you have in being unable to predict, unable to account for why I did this word trip, if I didn't have the right structure, can, a lot of them can be captured together in a very notion, a very simple notion of, that you can use as a sort of overall metric of quantifying processing difficulty. And that's the notion of surprise. And that's a very simple information theoretic quantity. It's the log of the inverse probability of an event happening given some conditioning information or context. So um, if you put the log in base two, then it's in bits. Um, and that's how much information, in some sense, get relative to the model of the world that you have that the event conveys. I mean, this captures a very basic intuition about expectations, and which goes beyond language, but is ubiquitous in language as well. The more we expect event, the easier it is to process. Range of prediction engines, once again, I think that's resonant with many talks that we've seen today. So my brother came inside to chat, wash, get warm, are all things that people might say, but as you saw before, the children went outside to evokes play. Even though, now notice, once again, play would be a perfectly useful word, perfectly fine word to put in this position, okay? And some people may even think the word play in this context. But nevertheless, if you put play in these two situations, and I've done this in experiments, you find that in the context where it's highly predictable, people spend less time reading it, they may have their, their eyes may even skip over it altogether, and the brain response to it is distinctive. I know there are people in the group who are working on, uh, on brain responses to these kinds of things. And uh, once again, as I described very briefly in the previous slide, we can combine uh, this notion of surprisal with problems to grammars to give something that we might think of as grammatical expectations. And actually, this turns out to be very linkable to human behavior and real-time comprehension. So the surprisal, trans the, sort of the transform takes probabilities ranging from zero to one, zero to one, to a minimum of zero, if something has probability one, it can be zero bits of information. It might as well have not happened, as far as you're concerned, but it had to happen. And then as something becomes less and less pro likely, it becomes more and more surprising, uh, and a zero probability that would be infinitely surprising, but it never happens, fortunately. And we can ask, what's the relationship between this, how likely something is to happen or in, in, in log probability space, and how long people, how hard it is to process? And, um, the best workhorse tool that we have in behavioral psycholinguistics for this is looking at how long people take to read a work in its context. Reading is a highly naturalistic activity. People will do it very, you know, people are highly skilled, people are, you know, people are practiced at it, and uh, people are well optimized for it because it's so important for your daily life if you're literate in, in a contemporary society. So you can take multiple methods, so a couple of methods are self-paced reading and eye tracking, and uh, you can just have people read text, and you can put a computational model on those texts and see how probably probability each word is, and then you can try to figure out what the relationship is. This is not a trivial problem, it's a problem of statistical inference because there are correlations uh, with other kinds of variables. So for example, words that tend to be more probable are also shorter, they tend to be uh, higher frequency and so forth. Um, and so, for example, word probability and frequency, are this is like correlation plots <coughs> that we've used, and you can see that log probability and log frequency are well correlated, but actually, there, there's enough spread for non-super rare words that you can actually distinguish these with big data. So we use big data and we use non-parametric statistical inference tools. In the literature, there have been many hypothesized shapes uh, for the relationship between probability of a word in its context and reading time. And ours is the straight line hypothesis, but you can see that hypotheses of opposite shapes in either direction have been proposed. And this is one of my favorite pieces of work that I've been involved in. Um, it turns out that when you um, when you look at this at scale uh, with the computational model then, and and, uh, and statistical uh, non-parametric inference, you actually do get basically the, the, the straight line, but in two different methods, two different data sets, two different methods. Actually, not only is the line pretty much straight in both cases, but in fact the number of the milliseconds per bit is actually pretty comparable between the methods, which I think is sort of cool and encouraging. Um, 
So, uh, so that's um, that's really uh, you know sort of cool that we can take a lot of different kinds of phenomena. Ambiguity resolution. Um, I didn't get to talk about surprising versus less surprising structure outside of ambiguity. Um, also, these word prediction effects and capture them in this uh, metric that incorporates implicitly all the things that go into how we're predicting in real time structures, semantics, and so forth. And that actually is, is, uh, has a strong prediction value of incremental costs. And now, with that stage set, I want to turn to contemporary and open language models, um, which are everywhere. AI language models are everywhere, whether it's on your phone, in your house, in your web browsing or your translation work, scientific paper reading perhaps, or on the other end of your job applications, which is a little scary if you think about it, right? Um, and in particular, these models also like neural language models get in the news. So for example, email autocomplete is something. You probably noticed that in the last couple of years, Gmail started doing, just aggressively doing autocomplete. And uh, you know, it's, it's not as terrible as it might be. And it, maybe some of you feel that it's useful. I'm, I'm sort of on the fence, but the technology is already in deployment. It's there. It's in our consciousness. And it also, uh, uh, it's covered a lot of technology. So um, people have heard of BERT probably. So there's in NLP, there's a spate of, uh, currently we're in a wave of Sesame Street character named um, models. And so uh, BERT made news last year. You also probably heard about OpenAI generating a, fake, a, a model that they thought was too dangerous for, um, for public release. But what I want to do is now, I want to actually look a little bit more into the behavior of these models. Um, aside from uh, the summary facts that we get out of, uh, out of um, the overall, the traditional evaluation metrics that are used. So if you've worked in natural language processing for a while, I, I really the, and I, I think people who have taught who work in vision really are also, like the things you've said during this workshop are also resonant with it. The, the, the advances from deep learning really are truly remarkable. So if you're looking at quantitative me methods, the, if you're just asking how good are models of word prediction, um, the workhorse, uh, the workhorse um, evaluation technique is perplex perplexity, which is sort of like a, it's, it's a systematically related to, to like per word surprisal. Um, and you can think of it as like on average in some sense of average, how many guesses would it take you to guess the next word in the sentence correctly? And uh, you know, I was in graduate school when the test set perplexities were in the hundreds. Um, and uh, then um, with massive data, so this is what huge data got us. This is like Google, the Google Books Ngram data set got us down to 67 perplexity using Ngram models, which probably many of you are familiar with. Deep learning has taken us from that to cut complexity over and half. So for example, even just three years in the relatively early days of deep learning for language, a, a billion word trained model was able to get a, a complexity of 30, which is cutting that once again over in half. Um, and, uh, oops, and um, you know, these days, in fact, actually, there are even better models. So in the last year, we've gotten actually down to close to 20, which is just incredible. Um, but those are numbers. What do the models actually do? I want to understand what the models have learned as English, because they're probably in my daily life, even in places that I don't recognize it. But also, um, there's a, there are fundamentally deep scientific questions. So these are models that are learning from nothing more than textual data. Okay. The exciting thing in terms of the era of big data is that now these data sets are inside, which are the size of a human childhood's worth of experience, the size of a human lifetime worth of experience, in order of magnitude, or maybe even two orders of magnitude beyond the human lifetime of experience. And we can ask what kinds of generalizations, which we attribute to human productivity and creativity, traditionally, are ones that will actually simply emerge from very large models that are able to do flexible kinds of generalizations that are not hardwired to do hierarchical structure in the same way as the trees that I just described. What is actually evident in the data? And I find that a deeply interesting, fascinating so um, just to give you some intuitions about this, one way you can do this is uh, you can ask, you can give a model a beginning of a sentence, you can ask it to continue. There are interactive opportunities to do this online. So for example, if I give, this is this uh, Joseph Vitz et al. 2016 model. If I give the girl the newspaper to this model, then it might get me out. Uh, now it calls his girlfriend has really been hateful. So how's that? Is that good? Raise your hand if you think good job model. Raise your hand if you think bad job model. 
Okay, I'm gonna argue the opposite. I think this is really, really good, okay? And the, re the way that you judge this is, I want you to turn down your meaning dial and turn up your grammar dial. The meaning model, these models have terrible meaning representations. And this is immediately shows that. Very, very easy to show that. But actually, the model does some really good things. Let me, let's just actually parse this out. The newspaper now calls this girl his girlfriend. I don't know who his is, but it's some person. This newspaper calls this girl the girlfriend of some guy. And that girl has really been hateful. Perfectly well-formed sentence. Possibly weird meaning. Possible appropriate in some context. But perfectly well-formed. Let's try something harder. So I'm going to give that a check, green check. Okay. The monologue that the actor who the movie industry likes made silent was being uploaded. Let's see. Raise your hand if you say good job, model. Raise your hand if you say bad job, model. You flew few brave free of souls. I'm going to say good job, model, and let me explain it to you. So this also, very bizarre meaning, but actually it's not even quite as bizarre as you would think. Let's, let's just parse it up. The movie industry likes the actor. The actor made the monologue silent, and the monologue is being uploaded. Right? See it? Yeah, perfectly fine. You guys, in Germany, people should be really good at this because you're really good at these complex, multiple centered embedding structures where things get set, the verb and the subject and the object get separated far from each other. I'm going to give this a check and say, great job. That was really impressive. Uh, it's not always so, uh, so impressive, though. So, for example, the man in the car, continue this, the man in the car has gained longingly after years. X, easy to tell, not enough verbs. They did not, this was not a good speech. <laughs> and finally, the, the athlete to the restaurant would justify decided to add the main West Coast restaurants to his menu and who hadn't upgraded from his previous suite into a more, un that's unknown word, steakhouse in New York. I don't even know what to do with that. I don't even know how to call that, okay? And this actually, you get a lot of this kind of behavior too in these models, but actually, I, I think these are very good successes. And they're, like the old, the end ground models of old days would not be doing this. They would not be succeeding. So this, uh, this state of affairs poses both technical and theoretical questions. On the technical side, we're intensely interested in, if we're going to be using these models, uh, what generalizations are these models learning? Who recognizes this picture? So this movie, this movie Arrival, is, is as good, for, from the science fiction perspective, it's as good an account in a movie of linguistics as you can ever hope for an account of a science. So they really did a very decent job. It's a linguistics. So these are these alien creatures that have a language of their own, and we have to figure out what it is. Um, and that's sort of what the situation that we're in now, too. We have these alien creatures that have arrived in our midst called deep learning models of language, and they, they do things that sort of seem like human-like language, but they're clearly not quite human-like language, and we'd like to understand what it is that they're doing and why. And, but there's also a theoretical question. This is one of the greatest questions in the history of cognitive science. Um, how is language learned? How learnable is it? How learnable, how much information could we get about the general abstract properties of language from the raw data? The more formal specification of this problem is how well would positive input data alone deliver the right linguistic generalizations to a generic flexible learner without strong hierarchical bias? That is, a learner who's not narrowly constrained to look only for language structures that we think are that a linguist would give in those structures. Okay, so, how strong and how bad is the poverty of the stimulus? It's that question. And, and so we can actually start to operationalize these questions by pretending that in the mind of this beautiful little child is an alien creature that's come down and has amazing generalization capabilities and can learn at scale. And uh, uh, I think that the psycholinguistics paradigm that um, Duca talked about yesterday, um, a lot of which was initiated just a few years ago by this work by uh, Collins and Yoel Goldberg um, and Emmanuel Fu. Um, it is really a neat, uh, it, 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 you can use this in many, many different ways, and you can, you can ask a lot of questions that, once again, are both great scientific and technical work, uh, and technical problems. And so, the, simple, the simplest version of this subject verb agreement, you already heard about this. In the context of the keys to the cabinet, a human like generalization is that the right verb number should be singular, it should be, sorry, it should be uh, plural in this case, because the subject is plural, even though the, the immediately preceding noun is singular. So this would be a bad inference, this would be a good inference. So the model should predict that B is more probable than A. Got some model. I should have A is surprising, B is unsurprising. I should get that out. Okay. And so, um, and we can operationalize this using surprisal, actually. It turns out for, for theoretical reasons that I can talk about later on, surprisal in log probabilities is a good space in which to judge, uh, to judge how strongly different the model's predictions are for two different things in the context. The basic reason is that if two things are both very unpredictable, the, 
model may very strongly favor one over the other, but the absolute probability of differences may be very high, but in log space, they may be very large. There's a lot of information carried in the small probability space. Um, and, uh, and actually, a, a part of the work that we're doing in this area is to contrast different generative models, both of which have neural components, um, in, uh, in how language comes about uh, and, and contrast their behavior in these ways. So one, of course, is the sequences, like with these long short-term memory models, where there is a sequential architecture that maybe has some inter inter interesting internal structure to it, like the long short-term memory model that has both a sort of predict the next thing state called the hidden state and the cell state that can store a little bit more and adapt what we want to store. And so this, we have blocks that are just left going left to right and words are generated one at a time from this model. So that's one. And then there's the tree bank. There's a tree based method where you also have a, a, an LSTM type architecture, but actually what it's doing is not generating words in the sequence, but actually generating, um, I, I think I've lost the microphone by the way. Um, also generating um, uh, tree generation action. So in this context, I would know the So in this con is this on? Yeah, okay. In this, so in this context, I would be I would have generated the hunger cap, but I would also know that I would, the next thing I would have to do would be to elaborate a certain piece of syntax tree. Like I would be in a verb phrase, and so there are different things that I could do there than if I were in some other kinds of phrase. And then I use neural generalization to look at the tree structure, to look at the words, to look at the past tree generation actions, and then predict next tree actions. So it says I, I can learn flexibly features and generalizations, but I'm doing that on hierarchical structures. And so we have comparisons between the different kinds of models, both large data models, like this billion word model from Joseph and Vincent all 2016, a medium-sized model that's turned out to work very well for reasons that I think are still not that well understood. You could and others are helping us understand it better. Which has about a child, this is about a human lifetime's worth of experience. This is about a childhood's worth of experience. And a million words is not a lot of experience. And we have, but for these small models, we have the country bank that we can use so we can train either sequence models, LSTM models, or recurrent neural network grammar models that do have higher level structure. Um, so I'm going to give you just a, a few um, examples of this, which both, I think, illustrate some of the impressive learning successes of this kind of model, but also illustrate some challenges. Um, so I'm going to actually strip down what I'm going to use the same kind of methods that I talked about for illustrating why the woman brought the sandwich, different versions of those are harder or easier. And I'm going to apply them to these neural networks. So here's a simple sentence. Let's see what you think of it. The doctor studied the textbook. OK sentence, right? as the doctor studied the textbook, period. Not so good, right? There's something wrong with that, yeah? Okay. People feel comfortable while I give that an X. Why is that? It's incomplete, yeah, that's right. It's incomplete because if there's an as, after you finish one clause, you should have another clause. So as introduces a subordinate clause, and a, a, a human-like generalization is like, okay, now I'm in the subordinate clause, and when I know the subordinate clause, I should have the main clause. And uh, so this, fa this fails to do that, and so it's bad. Um, so I'm going to give it an X. How about the doctor studied the textbook, the word nurse walked into the office. How's that? I see, uh, what if I give that a yellow question mark? Does that seem right? Yeah, it's not so great, but it's not as bad as the second one. Does that seem right? Great. How about this? As the doctor studied the textbook, the nurse walked into the office. Perfectly fine, right? Okay, great. So this illustrates what in psychological experimental methods is called an interaction design, where there's two properties in the sentence. Either it has the word as at the beginning or not, and it has a second clause after the first clause or not. And the, there's an interaction property uh, between those two. Those two properties have to be either, either both on or off in order for the sentence to be well formed. And that's, that is a hallmark example of grammatical dependency. And what I'm going to do to ask, well, does a model capture that? is I'm going to ask the following. So I'm going to place, I'm going to say, I'm going to divide the sentence here. And I'm going to say everything before it is, I'm going to call that the context, and everything after it is the completion. And I want to look at the conditional log probability of the completion given context. Now, the top two have this very short completion. The bottom two have this very long completion. So I can't really do a direct comparison of the top two to the bottom two. But what I can do is I can ask the following. So in these things, these cases, which I'll call the no matrix cause variance, I'll call them no matrix because 
there was no second clause in the linguistic decimeters clause, versus the bottom ones, those are the matrix variant. There is a subsequent matrix clause after textbook. In the top two, if I look at the difference in these log probabilities and these surprisals of the completion, I should have a difference where this is less surprising than this, right? So there should be, if I were to subtract this from this, uh, sorry, if I were to subtract this from this, I should have a positive number, a positive surprise, or a positive surprise difference. The pattern should be the opposite in this case. In this case, this should be a reasonable completion. So if I subtract this surprise from this surprise, I should get a negative number. And um, so I can ask this, and uh, these are going to be in the two large language models. Once again, I have these no matrix versions, and I'm going to expect a positive number on the axis and a negative number in the matrix versions on the axis. And <coughs> so what find, the answer is that it's sort of an interesting case. So these are, well, this is a billion word model, this is a hundred million word model. Actually, so both the models do capture the facilitation, the sort of less surprisingness of this matrix clause the, from the word has. Um, but actually, only the smaller data model, the 90 million word model, actually gets this other effect. In fact, this billion word model that has staggeringly good perplexity fails to get that very basic fact that you can't just end a sentence after as the doctor studied the textbook period. Okay, so this is actually a dramatic failure. I can also um, look at uh, both the, uh, these are those models again, but I can look at these small models trained on a million words of data. Once again, the sequence only model really learns very little, although it does get this matrix facilitation. But actually, the grammar-based model has a very human like pattern. In fact, it really cares a lot. It really does not like to end that sentence with, uh, after as without having a main sentence. Okay. So that's one example. Um, here, I'm also going to come back to the one draw the sandwich example, which is, once again, it's called this garden path disambiguation. Here, I'm going to care about the conditional probability of this last word, given the preceding context. And once again, now here, here's a, here, there's actually a different pattern that I predict. So in this case, there should be a big difference between these two. Adding the words who was here makes it impossible for Brock to be the woman doing the bringing. That should make this word trick less confusing. So if I take the difference between these two, if I subtract this from this, sorry, I, the other, I'm doing it the other way around in this case. If I, if I subtract this from this, I should have a positive number. Here, it's not so clear, okay? The woman given the sandwich from the kitchen trip, the woman who was given the sandwich from the kitchen trip. In principle, who was shouldn't really make any difference here, but minimally it should make less of a difference. I'm just going to show you the small data model results in this case. Um, so we should have a big surprisal difference and not so big, I, maybe zero, maybe just smaller. Um, and the answer is that, uh, is that for the small data models, once again, the, um, uh, the, the structural supervision helps a lot, but even the small data model gets a bit of the effect. And neither model completely learns to avoid this misinterpretation. And so actually, there's, I would call this sort of partial success, but also some evidence that maybe a grammatical supervision component is helpful. Um, and these are two examples of a much richer range of examples from this paper, Pete Brell et al. 2019 in Nettle, where we look at a lot of the different kinds of these structural, these ambiguous, what we can think of as the models maintaining a syntactic state over large stretches of material. And we have, so we have a lot of different investigations of this. And I would say it's actually quite impressive what the models are able to learn, but the learning is also not complete, and those are the, the, the X's. Um, and the last uh, type of thing that I want to talk about uh, briefly is something that's been at the heart of linguistic theory for a long time, uh, since the dawn, of, the dawn of the modern and cognitive science, really. Um, so, and it's called filler gap dependencies. So, uh, just to illustrate an example like this, let's take the sentence, I know that the lion devoured the gazelle at sunrise. It's a perfectly fine sentence, right? What I want to call your attention to is the relationship between the word that and the gazelle. Namely, there is no relationship. Okay? So if I were to draw a tree structure for this, what I would find is that that is somewhere in the tree structure and the gazelle is in the tree structure, but there's no semantic linking between the two. And there's also no sort of, there's nothing unusual about this structure. So I would say this relationship, it's not a linked relationship, but it's a perfectly fine coexistence. Likewise, I could change both that and the gazelle. I could change it to, I know what the lion, I'm, so I'm gonna, I could change it to, I know what the lion devoured at sunrise. That's also fine. I know what the line of our is on this. But now, actually, oh, sorry, this shouldn't be a line, this should be a what. So what and the lack of the, the lack of anything here matter a lot, because if you change either one, you get something that's wrong. So for example, if I have, I know what the lion devoured the gazelle at sunrise, that's really weird, right? And the reason is that devoured means an object. So um, in a way, what's surprising is that this is okay. But the reason is, is that what plays the role of the object in this structure, this is what's called a filler gap structure. 
just to go back a slide, in this situation, what plays the role of this object? You know, both semantically, you can see it. I'm talking about the thing that got devoured. That's what I know. But also syntactically, the presence of this one licenses the absence of an object. And if I only do one of the two, then I'm going to be in a weird form, weird sense. I know what the line devoured is at sunrise, really weird. Or I know that the line devoured at sunrise feels really like something's missing. Everybody have that intuition? OK. So now I want to show you what these large data language models learn about this kind of structure. Now I'm going to use, I'm going to show you different example materials that uh, just because I have more real estate to pull, fit the, fit the pull examples here. So um, I know that versus what my brother said our aunt devoured the cake at the party. When I have that, it should be fine. When I have what, it should not be so fine. And of course, this difference should show up if I look at a left to right language model, not if the model is exhibiting human-like behavior, the big difference in behavior should come here. Even though the context has changed here, it doesn't really matter as much in this situation. It should really matter here. Okay. And that's actually exactly what we see. Well, there's, there's actually two things that happen, and they're both understandable. Um, so, so you'll see, I, I've got, I, I know what or that, my brother said, our aunt. So first of all, the words are different here, so you wouldn't expect the same surprises here. Now our aunt, notice that I, I know what my brother said devour the cake would be fine as well. So it would be fine to drop this thing, but it's not dropped. What finds that a little surprising, but actually at the cake, you also have this surprisal differential. Getting the cake is more surprising in this situation than it is in this situation. And so the red line is above the blue line. But in the other areas that don't involve an odd argument that could be emitted, there's no difference. Okay, so it's actually a very interpretable review like that. Correspondingly, I can also ask, what does this look like if I drop the object? Um, but like, I know that my brother who, uh, said our aunt devoured the party. And now I actually get, in very, uh, I get an opposite pattern where the, um, first of all, once again, the model is surprised at this frame our aunt in the what condition. But more importantly, if I have what here, then I'm not so surprised when I skip over the object devoured and go straight to at the party. Whereas if I have the word that, I am more surprised at that. Because I expected if I have the word that, then I expected an object. And so I can take these two things together and I can sort of, um, I can look at these loci of difference and I can sort of collapse them together. I, and I'll just take, I'll just take the, sorry, I'll take the difference in the line sizes between the two. So I'll just subtract out the blue line from the red line and I'll get what you can look at as a, an effect of this WH word, an effect of the filler, and see its processing time signature. And when you have a filler, it makes, a place where you expected a gap, surprising if there's no gap, but it makes a place where you expect a gap less surprising to jump over what would have been there. And that's this positive thing here and this negative thing here. And that's a very thing like processing pattern. And the size of this, you can sort of think of as the size of the effect. Another really cool thing is that these dependencies are actually unbounded. So I can say I know what our mother gave to Mary last weekend. I know what our mother said that your friend gave to Mary last weekend. I'll call those zero levels of clause in between our mother and gave to Mary. Here's one level of clause said that your friend. Here's two. I know what our mother said that her friend remarked that your friend gave. I said know that what our mother said that her friend remarked that the parking attendant wondered that your friend gave. And I'm not even going to try to say this one because it's so <laughs> complex. But actually, if we look at the size of that effect that I just showed you on the last slide, like how much the model is sensitive to the relationship between what? And the presence or absence of this thing, it actually, in this billion word model, it's extremely robust. <coughs> Even in the hundred word model, it's maintained, although in a decreasing size, throughout all that complexity. So it's actually doing something maybe even almost superhuman-like, but very much grammar informed. Um, and I'll just, um, since I'm a little over time, I'm just going to end with addressing one possible concern, which is that um, there is a concern here that, well, maybe what I'm learning in that dependency between the words what and that and the presence or absence of a noun phrase in some other place is not a hierarchical dependency, which is what a language would claim is the syntactic generalization. But it's actually a linear dependency. It's just that when the word what appears before the word that, uh, before, the, before an object noun phrase is missing, then I just remember it. And so I, and this actually has nothing to do with hierarchical structure. So maybe the models are learning that dependency between elements, but it's not along the lines of linguistic structure that a human would be sensitive to. And there's actually a way we can test that. And the, re and the way we can test it is that 
we know from, uh, from linguistic theory that a filler must be appropriately above its gap in some sense. And basically what it, above its gap means means that if this is this thing, then its sister has to contain its gap. So this is where the gap has to occur. But we can actually create materials that test whether the model shows that kind of sensitivity. And so here's an example. Let's take a sentence that starts, the fact that the mayor knows who, think about how, think for a moment how that sentence might continue. So here's one way you can continue it. The fact that the mayor knows who the criminal shot, shot the jury, right? Complex sentence, but perfectly sensible, right? Okay. You'll notice that the gap here is below the filler in that sense. It's inside this thing. Here's a way I couldn't continue it. The fact that the mayor knows who the criminal shot the teller shot. You probably feel that there's that something, there's something really off there. Right? And the reason is that, once again, like what's wrong with the word who filling in this thing here? The fact that the mayor knows who shot, who got shot, basically. But the answer is that this is not allowed because the, fill, the gap does not appear below, in a hierarchical sense, the fill. And so this should be made. What does this mean for our model? It should mean that if I look at these kinds of structures, we should see sensitivity to who versus that here, but not here. Okay? And so let's look at what this looks like. So these are those kinds of examples. Um, the fact that the, the policeman knows who, who or that the criminal shot here. This is the place where a filler could uh, be related to a gap, and we see that this sends their sensitivity to who versus that here inside that structure. But we'll, and uh, so this is the this is when there's no gap. Okay, so the model is actually with who it's expecting something to be missing, and it's surprised when nothing is missing. Here's another version. The fact that the policeman knows who or that the criminal shot with a gun reassured the mayor last year. There now I've left out the gap, and, or sorry, I have a gap, I've left out who got shot, and now there is surprise when I was, uh, there was surprise when I wasn't expecting anything to be left out, when the word that was used. So it's the opposite pattern, and that's once again a human-like pattern at this position inside this clause. But now here's the third version, which is the fact that the policeman knows who or that the criminal shot the old widow with a gun reassured last year. Once again, reassured is missing an object. And actually, if you were paying attention, these, no, these, these bars are both higher than they were in the early examples. So the model is surprised not to have an object of reassured, but it's not more or less surprised depending on whether this word was who or that. Even though who or that, that is proceeding in linear space, this position where something is left out. So it's not just a linear precedence. And in fact, these are shorter sentences than those extraordinarily complicated sentences that I gave you later earlier, where there was sensitive. This is actually, if I were a linguist and I were going to draw a tree structure over it, I would draw a tree structure where this position is too high in the syntax for the filler down here to relate to it. And it seems like the model is also insensitive. It doesn't draw that relationship. And once again, these are models that are trained from the um, And I, I, can, I can, you know, sort of summarize all those three gap, all those three here, in that um, you sort of see these two are the things that you saw before, and the green line is this behavior in the, ma in the matrix cap position where the object of reassured is missing, and you just don't see much of anything else. Um, I'm gonna, I, I have a whole bunch of things that I, I could talk about, but I'm just gonna stop because I'd like to leave a little bit of time for discussion. The main thing I just wanna mention is that there's something really, really interesting um, and deep in the debates about learnability, which are called syntactic islands, <laughs> which are cases like the syntactic hierarchy case where something is disallowed, okay, where you're not allowed to have a filler gap dependency. So for example, I know what Alex said, whether your friend devoured at the party, probably sounds really weird. And it's the reason that weather blocks a filler gap dependency. And these are actually of great theoretical interest because they would require learning from negative evidence if there were structures. But it actually turns out that these models, once again, purely from string data alone, if you give them enough data, they can actually acquire island generalizations as well. I won't go into any of the details of that because I'm over time. But I want to just mention one last thing is um, this is just a bit of an advertisement for a collaborative project that we're doing in my group. We're, we're taking a lot of these kind of test methods that I described before, the subordinate clauses, the garden pathing, the filler gap dependencies, and we're collecting them together 
into a large repository that they actually hope that people working in uh, natural language processing will test their models on, and that people who are working in psycholinguistics and in theoretical linguistics will contribute test suite materials to. And uh, so go to syntaxgen.org and you can sign up for notifications, and uh, we're, we're, we're hoping for an alpha release in the next couple of months. Um, but uh, all of the things that I described to you just then are going to be in that and many more things, and things in other, other papers and elsewhere. But just to summarize, I hope, in the, hope in the, hopefully in the first part of the talk I've convinced you that um, the computational cognitive science and natural language processing have helped us really in powerful ways to develop and test precise psycholinguistic theory. We, and we've made a lot of theoretical understanding, advanced theoretical understanding, and made empirical discoveries on how comprehension is incremental, structured, and probabilistic. And in, ter in turn, psycholinguistics has shed light on NLP models now. We can see the incremental syntactic state like behavior. We can see the philagogic tendencies. I didn't have a chance to take that a lot of family constraints. But I also showed you examples of where really structure, having explicit structural representations, really matters a lot. And I think that this points to the fact that we're probably not done with just deep learning that's completely unstructured. We have to understand carefully the invective biases that the architectures that we're exploring have, and understand how to create new architectures that maybe incorporate either explicitly or implicitly the insights and, um, and preferences for symbolic, hierarchical, discrete structure. Um, and uh, this, I think, is a wonderful challenge for the entire scientific and engineering community. Um, and this, is, this and many other opportunities are available in bringing together NLP and psycholinguistics and more broadly AI and cognitive science. So please, everybody, I know you're here to seize them. Please go out and do so. Um, so I want to thank collaborators once again, my lab, funding, and other support, and all of you.
So natural language, and especially language targeted at children, is, and I, I zero back on natural language processing, but I think is structurally different to what we write in Wikipedia and the words we use and the complexity it's building up slowly. Would you think that training models on these natural language corpora first uh, or only would help sort solve some of the issues? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, uh, so I absolutely take it anyway that that's uh, maybe that's a version of the point that I made. <laughs> I, yeah, brought I, your pocket. I think it's well, it's very well taken. Well, so, I think yeah. it's absolutely appropriate. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is it's actually not just so clear to me that like getting read Wikipedia by an engaging uh, an actor who's trained to work on Sesame Street would actually be that terrible. Um, I, I think actually it's just like I think that's a difficult open question. Now there are the child language uh, and child directed speech has been studied a lot, and there are structural differences as you say. It's simpler. And that's a really big feature of it. And I think it's an interesting and important open question. So, so just to say, like, we could try to train, in, in principle, we could like, try to train the 90 million words of childhood speech. We just don't have that much data available. Uh, but there are other questions about, like, for example, for the same total amount of data, would you do better with like a curriculum learning approach that has more common language early on? Like, would you actually get better, better learning efficiency? I think that's a really interesting open question. If you go back to 